Well, I was putting away all the remnants of Christmas 2017. Amen. Who's with me? Is there any, ha any hanger honors? Oh, there, there you go. Don't worry. You are not alone. There were many in uh, the 830 service who were like enthusiastically, absolutely, the Christmas decorations are still out. But I put them back into insulated boxes, protective bins, went the ceramic and the porcelain and the popsicle stick ornaments that the kids have made. I'll see you in about 315 days, waving nostalgically as the bins went back up into the attic. Worst job ever, by the way. Amen? Yeah. It was brightened only by the insistence that my children would help me. Amen? Or would not have screen time. So <laughs> they, had, they, had to, they had to help. Um, but as I was undecorating, um, it struck me even further this question. Why the wise men? The magi? Why are they even a part of the birth narrative of Jesus? Have you ever thought about this? You're probably thinking, no, not really, amen? <laughs> this may be think things that pastors think about, but you're probably spending your mental energy thinking about job opportunities, um, the sort of life trajectory of your children. You're probably wondering, why is it I always start out with pairs of socks in the sock drawer and they always end up single? Always, amen? But we're also spending time thinking about the state of our nation, aren't we? We're thinking about the sustainability of the planet. We're thinking about um, those loved ones who are close to home and struggling. We're thinking about these things. So you probably don't designate a lot of mental space towards the presence of the Magi in the birth story of Jesus. But this morning, I do want us to consider why the wise men. What is God saying through their presence in the narrative? After all, when you think about it, they're, they're a bit out of place. God seemed to have a theme going when you consider everyone who was involved within the incarnation, God with us, Jesus coming into the world. The participants, they were of similar backgrounds, sort of socioeconomic place. Mary and Joseph, as far as we can tell from the scriptures, um, they were working class. There probably really wasn't a middle class per se at this time in history. They were making it paycheck to paycheck. Um, you think about um, the fact that when the royal decree came through, Mary and Joseph had to travel like everyone else. There was no first class for them. They did not have the pull or the clout or the connections when they arrived in Bethlehem to land a hotel room much less a hospital room or a midwife to assist within the birth of Jesus. And then you consider who the angels tapped to come and bear witness to the birth of Jesus, the shepherds, while they played a role within the local economy. They had a place within the job market. Um, they were not known, shepherds, um, to be particularly well-educated um, or well-connected within the sort of social setting and context of first century Palestine. But then come the wise men, amen? With their portfolios, their PhDs, their tenured positions. At every town that they pulled into, one of them would say, oh, I know someone here. We played golf a few years ago in Nineveh, amen? I'm sure we can just pull up and stay with them a few nights. Notice when they arrived in Jerusalem and they started talking about seeing the signs for a newborn king, their chatter, they ran within a social circle to the point that their talk landed on King Herod's daily briefing desk. Amen? And that King Herod personally summoned them, the wise men, into the corridors of power. They're just somewhat out of step. There was also a religious theme that God had initiated. Everyone was Jewish in the birth story of the nation of Israel. Mary, Joseph, steeped in the Hebrew scriptures, part of the Abrahamic covenant. Even the um, shepherds, we can make an assumption because they were not herding sheep. They were probably Jewish. So there was a religious theme, and then the wise men came 
who were decidedly non-Jewish. They were Gentile. Most biblical scholars think they probably came from Persia, uh, a nation hundreds of miles to the east of, of Judah. At one time within Israelite history, the Persians had conquered and had carried away the treasures of Israel. You know, their gold and frankincense and myrrh. And now, in some sense of a great reversal, they were traveling back to lay these same treasures at the feet of a newborn king. It just seemed a little out of step. Secondly, they were late, amen? And for those of you who appreciate punctuality, yeah, they were late. You may already be aware that while most nativities, they image the wise men there at the manger, at the stable. Biblically, we know, we heard in the passage read that the Magi, um, they did not visit Jesus in labor and delivery. Amen. They actually, um, the, the star at its rising, it signified the beginning of their journey, Jesus' birth, rather than the sort of stellar exclamation point at the end of it. Most biblical scholars assert that when you consider the celestial consultations, the scientific considerations, the journey itself, their engagements with King Herod, and the occasional cloudy night, amen, that it probably took them anywhere between one to two years to arrive and present their gifts to the toddler, Jesus, who was probably by that, tame, that time saying something like mama and dada rather than the delightful coups that newborns make. So it was, you know, a, they're, they're just a little out of place. So given the fact that they were out of place and they were one to two years late, why does the Gospel of Matthew include the wise men? I think um, for two significant reasons. First, their presence tells us that everyone has a place in the Incarnation. Stated differently, because of the Incarnation, God with us, everyone has a place in God's redemptive story. It was very intentional that the wise men be both present and out of place in the birth story of Jesus. And grace upon grace, when you look at that narrative, you see that God uniquely reached out to each one of the participants with this invitation to be a part of God, what God was doing in Jesus Christ in a unique way that they could understand, that they could wrap their heads around. For Mary, she needed an in-home visit, amen? For Joseph, it was a dream. The shepherds, for whatever reason, needed the drama of a terrifying night time angelic message in order to motivate them to go and see. But for the wise men who spent half their lives looking up and the other halves looking in a book, the star is what appeared that reached out to them to invite them to participate in what God was doing. It's very intentional that the wise men are present and out of place. It teaches us that God is an equal opportunity life changer. Amen? It teaches us that grace upon grace, God will reach out in a way that we can understand. God spoke to them, to the wise men, through the science of the day. And here's the real miracle. <laughs> they saw it. They took notice. They heeded they packed up, they followed, they went, and then they worshiped. God spoke to them and extended an invitation because God needed them all there to say that all had a place. That God wanted there to be people of various backgrounds and ideologies and religious traditions so that again and again, when we try to shrink the kingdom of God to those who look like us or think like us or to just people for that matter, God can point to the incarnation and whisper, 
I am so much bigger <laughs> than you can ever, ever imagine. God reached out to them in a way that they could understand. I suppose when you think of it, you can't really pack away the incarnation, amen? You can't package it till next year. You can ignore it. You can ignore the signs, be so distracted, or you can dismiss it. But God is continually reaching out to each one of us to be a more full participant in God's redemptive story. And God is doing it in your life right now. And I imagine doing it in a way and in a means by which you can more fully understand it. Amen. I remember I was talking for a time, um, I was talking, was in a conversation with a fourth year medical student. Um, her name is Katie. Um, I knew Katie because I had officiated her wedding two years prior. This is when we were living and I was serving a church in Idaho. Um, and I remember this conversation with Katie distinctly um, for two reasons. One, because I was holding Hannah, our eldest daughter, who had just been born. So she was fresh, <laughs> fresh, fresh little precious thing. And, um, the, and also because Katie shared that she had just had sort of a faith experience in her life that she wanted to talk with me about, that she came to see more fully um, the merciful God who was already present with her. And so we were talking, and it was actually our newborn that brought up the conversation. Well, Katie said to me, you know, I've struggled with this whole God thing. And I said, um, yes, I recall that. And I said, incidentally, I, usually people have less struggle with the God thing and more struggle with the church thing. Amen? But that's a whole different sermon, so we won't go there. Um, but I remember us talking, um, and she had shared, you know, two years prior, how she had renounced the faith of her youth, what she was sort of brought up in, um, but then felt like something was really missing, had tried many different ways to kind of fill the void, and just there was this always push and pull um, within her. And she said to me, she said, I took a step recently that you may want to know. She said, I joined a Bible study, small group, and I've been praying. And she said, it's just been really good. It's, it's, it's been good. Um, and I said, Had, did something happen that encouraged you to take this step? Sometimes, you know, there's fulcrum experiences. Um, you might call them an epiphany where God um, shows up a little more clear. Where, well, God's there, but we see God more clearly. So I was curious if there was sort of a fulcrum experience. And she said, it happened to me during my last rotation in medical school. She said, I was in obstetrics and we were looking at fetal development. She said, <laughs> I remember she said, because I'm holding Hannah. She said, did you know that your baby is really thousands and hundreds of cellular folds I said I had no idea amen I thought she was amazing but now I know for sure she said you know I was working there and studying this and there's sort of came a time where I was just overwhelmed by the sheer miracle of it all and that it works as often as it does and she said it was just an overwhelming mystery. She said, I always thought biology explained things much neater than theology. But I suppose there are some things you cannot know just by explanation. Sounds like faith. God reached out to her in a way that she could understand. It was like her own cellular star rising within the obstetrics rotation. And she saw it, and she turned direction, and she followed. She stepped out. The 17th century French theologian and scientist Blase Pascal, he says it this way, in faith there is enough light for those who want to believe and enough shadows to blind those who don't. Secondly, the wise men, they remind us that there is no place that the power of the incarnation is not already at work. 
There is no place that the power of the incarnation is not already, can't reach. That right from the beginning, Jesus' birth found and shook up down from the fields to the palace, from the family rooms to the boardrooms, from the heavens to the hillside. Therefore, Jesus coming into the world, it was both a deeply personal experience for people, right? So when they said yes to participate in the incarnation, it changed their lives. It changed their bodies. <laughs> Think about Mary. It changed their every day. It changed where they lived. It changed their residences. It changed their future. It was deeply personal. But the wise men, they show us, they remind us that Jesus coming into the world also had a systemic, it had a political implications right from the start. Because of the wise men's willingness to see, to follow, to seek, to humble, worship, the powers got involved. The incarnation, it will continue to extend an invitation that is both deeply personal and also very corporate. We care about the homeless family that we met through the Caritas ministry, but we also work to dismantle systems that keep people poor. We ask for God to help us treat every person that we meet with respect and dignity, but we also see and acknowledge stand up against systemic racism that's at work within our nation. We support, we are involved in the MICA initiative, which is helping schools that are in need throughout our city and area. We are personally, we, we give school supplies, we help tutor a child, but we also work toward the end so that all schools have adequate funding to provide quality education. Because when Jesus shows up, it is both profoundly personal and it's also radically public. Amen? Okay, so why the wise men? Why the wise men? As you begin this new year, consider these two things, that these these wise men, they traveled a very long way and a long time in order to tell us. First, if you find yourself whittling down the kingdom of God to your usual suspects, remember the wise men. And secondly, remember that there is no place where the power of the incarnation is not already at work. There is no place where God is not already. The Franciscan monk, Richard uh, Rory, says that this cannot not live in the presence of God. You are totally surrounded and infused by the presence of God. But the question is like the wise men. Do you see? Are you taking note? And then are you packing up? And given all the things and the people, and the trends, and the fears, and the possibilities, and all the things that you could follow in 2018 is where you're headed. Is it leading you to Jesus? Is it leading you to life? Let us pray.